Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Usman Sadiq Paracha and today we would be having our lecture number 16 of the subject Applied Quantitative Analysis and Practices. Previously we were focusing on, uh, on the topics basically uh, assumptions in testing of hypothesis and uh, within that respect basically we first covered how to test the hypothesis and uh, what are the basics for that, how to test them, what are basically uh, the procedures which are involved in testing such kind of hypothesis and why do we need to test the hypothesis in this case specifically. So uh, in this case again we discussed about uh, that before testing any kind of hypothesis it is very much important that certain conditions, certain assumptions must be met. If they are not met then the results from such hypothesis or conclusions from such hypothesis uh, would not be very much viable in this case. So that's why uh, this was an important topic which was covered and in this uh, there were certain specific assumptions uh, which uh, were needed to be discussed and one of them we discussed about was additivity and linearity. So uh, this was important that uh, the linear uh, property of the data should be there and we discussed how to check that out and uh, Normally we discussed about the PP plotting or QQ plotting, how to do that in SPSS through different tools and then the other very famous tool for checking that is histogram. So we had already uh, covered that aspect of how to generate a histogram and how to then check out whether the data is linear or not. So uh, within that aspect we also covered uh, the important factor called normality and within those again uh, we discussed about uh, two very important tests. Uh, one was termed as KS test and the other was Shapiro. Uh, both of these tests were basically shown to you in SPSS how to test them and basically we discussed that both of these tests need to be insignificant so as to ensure that the data is normal. Uh, if these tests are proved to be significant then we have a problem. But then again uh, there was one discrepancy in those tests which we discussed and that was that uh, if uh, the sample size becomes larger then we are facing problem because mostly then such large samples uh, in those cases uh, normally both of these tests do report significant values. So uh, we also discussed that yes, it is necessary that we cannot wholly solely rely on KS test or Shapiro test to, to ensure the normality of uh, any kind of data. However, though these kind of tests are very ideal, if we are focusing on very small samples, preferably less than 30 in number. So, uh, after that we went on to discuss about homogeneity of variance and uh, this is aspect is very important regarding the fact that uh, uh, basically uh, both uh, predictor and the outcome variable uh, the variance of both uh, the variables should be kind of homogeneous, it should be kind of constant and we basically discussed it through a diagram that though we will 
be getting different values uh, for every different value of predictor we would be getting a different value of outcome but uh, we are not uh, basically uh, very much concerned about that we are more concerned that the spread of the data basically at each point normally and the variance remains the same so uh, this was one aspect which was discussed in detail then how to test this homogeneity of variance in SPSS and then how to uh, basically use alternative tools to see whether there is homogeneity of variance or not and we discussed about variance ratio in this case. Then again we discussed about how to ensure that there is independence of the two variables being considered here or more than two variables. So uh, these were the important assumptions uh, which cannot be neglected and basically we have to ensure through various software tests that uh, these conditions are met before we test any kind of hypothesis. Afterwards, uh, basically we discussed about when uh, we do come to know that these uh, conditions are not being met through one way or the another, then how to reduce such kind of bias. And in this, we discussed about the data trimming, how to trim the data. We know that uh, Normally, SPSS under its uh, descriptive analysis technique, it does uh, show us 5% trim mean, but what does that 5% trim mean mean? And also, how we can use this trimming data uh, facility to reduce the biasness or to reduce the outliers. So, after that, we uh, discussed about the winterizing factor and in that we came to know that uh, the trimming of data at the top, most top and bottom levels that we replace the outliers at the extreme end with the extreme values which are not outliers. So that was another method to try to reduce the biasness and abnormality of data. Uh, likewise, then we discussed about another technique with analysis of robust methods because as with the passage of time, more complex uh, methodologies, more uh, complex tools are now available to help us uh, solve and tackle this problem of uh, uh, biasness in data and data abnormality. So one of uh, the important tools which is now being used nowadays is called bootstrapping. So what was bootstrapping? We discussed about that. How to use it? Well, SPSS uh, does not have very much uh, specific tools uh, to carry out bootstrapping but in uh, latest versions of SPSS now they are basically ensuring that uh, at least some facility of such kind of robust methods must be there. Uh, then in the last and not the least we discussed about the data transformation because this is one more method to ensure how uh, to reduce the data biasness and uh, there are various ways through which we can transform the data. Of course, when we are transforming the data of any one variable in a specific model, then it also becomes essential that we basically transform the rest of the data in other variables also. So uh, that is the one condition and uh, the other thing is that uh, which kind of data transformation is effective and not effective is uh, another debate. So carrying on with that, uh, now uh, basically we discussed about three uh, 
kind of main transformations. One is log transformation, which we, we have uh, gone through a bit before. Then uh, square root transformation, both are basically used to tackle positive skewness and then square root transformation can also be used to stabilize the variance. Then is another transformation method which is termed as reciprocal transformation and this is also basically used to reduce the impact of large scores. Uh, there are many other uh, transformation as well like cube root transformation, cube transformation, then uh, uh, reciprocal of uh, uh, square root transformation. So basically uh, you can try as many transformations as you like and uh, to some extent yes they are effective. Uh, in reducing uh, some kind of biasness. We also discussed how to basically test uh, or basically test various kinds uh, of data uh, with uh, default option available in SPSS uh, which basically facilitate us to transform the data instead of manually computing a separate variable and then transforming the data under that variable and then testing it. So in order to facilitate us, SPSS has given us tools in which while applying any kind of test, we can also uh, give our option whether for that kind of test we need an untransformed data or we need a transformed data. And under that transformation option, we can give any type of data transformation technique which we want to imply. So uh, we basically discussed about that and their application as well. Uh, going through the details, uh, well, uh, we basically, uh, while going through the transformation factor, going to SPSS, we basically uh, use the same tools uh, which we have been using for transformation or computing other variables. For example, we go to transform and then we click on compute variable and then after that what we have to do is to write down our target variable uh, and the variable which we want uh, to be computed in this case and we also give the function in this case. All what we have to do is click on all and we can if, if you want to just calculate uh, the square root uh, we can click on S and we can select that function as you can see on the screen. The detail of that function is very much visible here on the box and uh, then likewise other functions are available which can be applied here and we can compute a separate variable and then we can try to see whether that specific transformation is that much effective or not. Other than that we have already discussed about how to test various uh, applications of SPSS and on uh, different kind of data and we in addition can also state that which kind of transformation is required prior to applying that test in SPSS. So uh, now basically going back to the issue, uh, now here what difference does this transformation make uh, when we are uh, applying certain test and uh, we can just have a look here as uh, you can see that uh, we applied log transformation here and uh, in this case before here uh, as uh, obvious here in this case uh, Let's have a look at it. Uh, in this case, uh, before 
the data uh, Uh, basically, what we have to draw here uh, and what the drawing which we are observing here, in this case, the data basically is not normal as you can see the downward trend here. That was before when we applied any kind of uh, transformation tool. Then afterwards, uh, when we did apply, there was uh, improvement in this downward uh, trend and also from the start here. So uh, basically, this is just an example of one variable in which we did apply log transformation, which is again another kind of transformation we can do in order to improve uh, our data normality. Uh, again, this must be ensured that once you are applying such kind of transformation in one variable, then at the same time, you have to apply for the transformation of other variables as well. So coming to the next example in which we have applied for square root uh, transformation here. Now here, uh, again, you can see the trend here in which it is very much clear that the data is not that much normal. We have applied square root transformation on the data and that has basically caused improvement in the normality of this variable. So likewise, we have got uh, the effects of a reciprocal transformation documented here. So uh, again, here you can see the downward trend and there was some sort of improvement in the data by applying reciprocal tool. And uh, such kind of tools basically you would have to try through hit and trial method and you have to see whether which uh, tool has more impact in stabilizing your data. So it's not... Uh, there's no specific uh, much of a uh, rule of thumb to apply a specific kind of transformation for a specific kind of abnormality. Though we have discussed uh, a vague uh, uh, description of, let's say, for positive skewness, you can apply this test or this kind of transformation, but it is not necessary that the transformation of that specific kind would be facilitating us. So uh, normally you would have to try all kind of transformations to see which transformation uh, method is more effective in making your data normal. So uh, going ahead with that again, uh, we are basically seeing the log here and uh, in, but in some cases, as you can see, this uh, in this case, the data was normal. But after transformation, it did basically disturb the normality of data. So we have to be very cautious in this case because we cannot just uh, apply a transformation tool randomly and just try to find out whether the data result which we obtained is normal or not. So uh, in this case, we have certain um, basically observations. And uh, the biggest debate in this case is whether we should go for transformation or not. And uh, basically, if we do transform the data, uh, we would have to see whether it affects uh, some other aspects of statistical analysis or not. And uh, it has been seen uh, that it does affect the accuracy of or some regression measures. And uh, that is why it is not that much often advisable that such kind of transformation be, uh, be carried out. Uh, so, uh, other thing, important thing is that uh, 
yes, according to some uh, arguments by researchers, that why carry out the transformation if we are stating that under central limit theorem, uh, like if the sample size is greater than 40, then that uh, would be normal anyways. But uh, counter argument by other researchers is that no, it's not necessary and we do have to treat the data individually in terms of every variable in order to ensure that there is meticulous normality um, reported from these uh, variables. So uh, now this basically argument has been repeated again and again, but then most of the researchers have advocated that uh, though under central limit theorem this is possible that data would be normal after a specific sample size, but normally there is a presence of huge outliers and we have to do something to uh, tackle such an issue. Now again the other argument against the data transformation is that for example the some kind of transformations totally change the nature of data. For example, let's say if we are saying about log transformation, then it basically uh, changes the data totally and uh, from there you just are uh, shifted from comparing the means to comparing basically the geometric means. Now there's a lot of difference between these two uh, mayas. So, that's why this is one argument which has been given against such kind of transformation and a group of researchers have always advocated that data transformation should be avoided. Now here again um, another argument in this case is that in small samples it is difficult to assess normality. So again in this case transformation does become a controversial issue. Uh, then again, uh, if we do apply some wrong uh, transformation, then it would basically bias our whole model and it would be more harmful to our whole findings or study findings. So that's why it is very much uh, important that uh, the transformation, the correct type of transformation and its implications uh, basically discussed in theory and in practice should be seen in detail and then after that some uh, concrete steps should be taken to uh, basically try to transform the data. So these are some uh, basically hindrances which do affect the results of data transformation and at the end maybe the results may not be that much conclusive due to these discrepancies of data transformation. So we have to basically uh, have a cautious approach to commence with data transformation so randomly. So in order to commence with data transformation, it is vital that you just have first a look at all the variables and their properties and in the light of theory, just have a look whether the data transformation would impact the other variables and your study findings or not. So if it does, then we have to be cautious in applying such kind of data transformation techniques. So data transformation as a whole can be a very effective tool, but on the other hand, it can impact our other test statistic results as well. So uh, it is not advisable to randomly basically apply data transformation uh, techniques. Uh, and uh, we have to basically apply those techniques while keeping in view their implications on theory and what impact they may have on our rest of data statistics. So uh, coming to our next topic which is related to reliability. 
basically the liability is as you can see the ability to measure to uh, produce the same result under the same conditions but uh, to be more specific we are basically focused on uh, the fact that how well the uh, questions which we are posing to the respondent how well uh, the questionnaire is representing a specific variable or construct how well these questions are uh, basically representing that construct and uh, how reliable they are so how consistent these questions are in uh, basically giving us an idea of the concept so uh, again uh, basically the other term uh, termed as test retest reliability and here this is just the ability of a measure to produce consistent result when same entities are tested at two different points in time so in here uh, basically let's go to the questionnaire to get a, a good uh, understanding of this reliability issue and uh, coming to the questionnaire related to training for example now here uh, we are basically measuring this training variable through six questions and each question basically is uh, asking uh, the input of the respondent from a different perspective but within the domain of domain of the construct so here uh, you can see our school for example conducts extensive training programs so basically we are trying to assess the continuity of training programs here under training and no employees will normally go through training programs every year so again uh, through these different questions we are trying to measure the phenomena of training within that organization so reliability here would mean that how well these questions represent the training construct here so main question here is related to the fact that do these questions really represent the construct of training so in order to address that problem or that question statistically we do use reliability measures or reliability tests to ensure that such kind of constructs are well represented through these questions so uh, again just like that another variable termed as performance appraisal is being measured by seven questions and we have to ensure that all these seven questions do represent the same meaning of performance appraisal and are interrelated to each other as you can see in this performance appraisal uh, basically uh, concept questions which are being displayed here now this construct is being measured by seven questions and we have to see that all these seven questions do represent performance appraisal so in order to do that what we do is that we do uh, conduct a pilot study for these all these variables and we try to get the responses from the relevant respondents and then try to judge their reliability whether the instrument which we would be using in our main study would it be reliable or not so going ahead with that uh, let's have a look at uh, the description so uh, here uh, basically what tool is being used by various softwares or statistics to assess the uh, reliability analysis so here in order to do that uh, we have one measure called Kronbach Zelfa and basically that is used for assessing scale reliability now there are certain rules and procedures in order to determine Kronbach Alpha and basically this alpha is an index associated with uh, variance accounted by true variance of the underlying construct so here basically uh, it helps us to measure the internal consistency 
and basically based on inter item correlation. Now again uh, it does tell us to what extent the questions in our questionnaire are related to each other and tells us whether the scale is unidimensional or multidimensional. Uh, here basically one of the many uses of Cronbach Alpha are depicted and uh, how to interpret the scale. Now this scale basically ranges from 0 to 1 and again uh, the higher the score the more reliable your generated scale is. Now here a score of 0 0.70 is uh, accepted and uh, considered so there is a brief chart given here. Now here basically uh, the acceptable score is said to be uh, 0 0.70 or greater than that. Uh, the interpretation is written here. For example, in case of higher reliability, the Kronberg Alpha should report figures above 0.90. Then in case that the value of Kronbach alpha lies between 0 0.80 to 0 0.89, even then it is termed as good reliability. And uh, we, under this sub-option of 0 0.70 to 0.79, uh, such kind of reliability measure basically is accepted, uh, not rejected. And then we have got the last option which ranges from 0 0.65 to 0 0.69. So in this case, this is though marginal reality, but you should check your questionnaire and the various uh, uh, tools available in order to see whether in reality such kind of reliability t exists or not. Uh, under this marginal reliability uh, space, there are other uh, values of reliability which have been termed, but normally in literature they have also been used. But again, you must have some solid justification to use a low Kronberg alpha. So in this case, uh, again, uh, you would have to take the aid of uh, basically um, literature here. The lower thresholds basically are used when we are uh, dealing with new variables and uh, or a variable which has been uh, studied in uh, other sectors and here in any selected sector it has not been used before. So for the first time when that variable is being tested then lower thresholds uh, are considered as valid for uh, basically reliability analysis. Now here uh, again uh, going through that the important part is uh, how to basically um, uh, use this reliability phenomena in SPSS and how to detect it. So we go to SPSS. So here we have got uh, many different uh, training uh, questions termed as uh, training 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now in order to find out the reliability analysis in uh, SPSS, what we have to do is click on Analyze and go to scale then click on reliability analysis. Uh, now here we have to state about which questions do we want to get evaluated under reliability analysis and in that case all what you have to do is to click on the first variable of training 1 and select it up till training 6 then we click on this arrow and they will come in this side. Then clicking on statistics, uh, we are interested in getting the descriptives or results for each item, which is also the question. And we have to use the scale. 
and we have to also give the scale if item is deleted any probable outcome in this case so we click on continue and we click on OK. Now here uh, we basically have generated the results of Kronberg Alpha and here you can see in reliability statistics reported Kronberg Alpha is set to be 0.95 of the whole six uh, similar questions. Now in the line of that uh, first item statistics are being showed in which we can see all the variables along with mean and standard deviation and n. Now here basically comes the real part in which the items total statistic or uh, is being reported here and in this case it is stating that training variable 1 if that variable has been uh, removed so this uh, head, header basically item total statistics gives us details that if a specific variable is deleted from that construct list then how much improvement that variable removal can have on Kronberg Alpha Meyer. So here you can see the Kronberg Alpha is reported to be 0.950 and if we basically delete the first variable as shown in the last column as shown in the mouse uh, if training variable uh, basically one is or first question is removed then Kronberg alpha would become 0.943 but this is uh, kind of controversial because originally under in, by including all these variables the Kronberg Alpha is 0 0.950. So uh, that means that deleting such kind of variable will only uh, get our strength of Kronberg Alpha uh, reduced, which is not advisable. Then coming on to the next one, training variable 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all have been enlisted with Kronberg Alpha if, if term is deleted. So if this item is deleted, then uh, again uh, in all these figures, the value which is being reported is less than the value of overall Kronberg Alpha. Now, as none of the values are adding up anything into the main Kronberg Alpha value, that's why it is necessary that we do not delete any of the variable questions because uh, all of them have been proved to be important in explaining the consistency of results in this case. So uh, again here uh, basically uh, you can let's say hypothetically if training variable 1 had got uh, the Kronbach Alpha of 0.97 and uh, in that case we would definitely have uh, choose training variable 1 to be deleted because by dele deleting it Kronbach Alpha of all construct is improved. Uh, now if uh, any variable value in this case therefore is concluded that if any variable value is uh, termed to be giving greater Kronberg Alpha than the existing Kronberg Alpha then it is important for us to first consider that variable application uh, in our theory and then uh, re by removing it what impact would it have on uh, our study findings. So based on that uh, these variables can be included and extracted. Uh, coming to the next part let's say it, we try to find out the reliability analysis of other uh, variables here. So I click on analyze, click on class uh, basically uh, this scale and click on reliability analysis. Now here uh, let's deselect all these options 
and uh, we select all the performance appraisal ones. We just want to have a look whether all the questions of performance appraisal do represent the meaning for which they are intended to. So we click on OK. And again, as you can see, the item total statistics have been reported. And here you can see that if overall performance appraisal Kronberg Alpha is 0 0.876, but here uh, there doesn't seem to be any variable which if deleted can improve the Kronberg Alpha. So we leave that uh, case for now and we move to other variables. So basically uh, when you are running for uh, running the test for uh, basically Kronberg Alpha then it is very much vital that uh, these Kronberg Alpha values if item is deleted are displayed uh, so that we can assume that which uh, basic uh, uh, statistic or uh, performance appraisal variable needs to be del deleted here in this case. Uh, coming to the next variable, uh, we click on scale and liability scales and then first deselecting all these and putting and back, we click on carrier planning and we select all the relative questions portrayed by various variables in this case and we click on arrow and then we click on OK. Now here again you can see that overall Kronberg Alpha reported for that variable has been 0.917. Now here the Kronberg Alpha if item is deleted does report values in 0.9 but all these values are already smaller than the values uh, given to us by a previous Kronberg Alpha. So in this case it is highly advisable to keep this HR practice questions. So uh, this is vital for every kind of study that the uh, measures you, you want to take do they have uh, shown reliability stability there. So once you have got reliability stability factor there, then based on that we can assume that the other values of other variables would also be correct for this Kronberg Alpha. Now in this way we can calculate the Kronberg Alpha of any construct we like and by clicking on this and going to scale and reliability analysis option. Uh, we can also opt for other statistics also if you click on statistics button and we have ticked on item scale and scale if item is deleted. Now uh, likewise other tests can also be used but here their uh, discussion is limited and it's of you no know, use to discuss them now with respect to that unless and until we find a good application for you to practice on. So uh, inter item uh, reliability analysis and correlations and covariance can also be reported here which are very helpful in deriving other uh, basically crucial uh, indicators in this case. So uh, then based on that we can also roll down the model part which you can see and here we can also mention which kind of model should be applied to calculate this reliability analysis which is again very much facilitating and here we can see that uh, there are multiple options like split half, Gutman, parallel, strict parallel. So it all depends upon the needs of the user that which kind of test results are required by his or her study. So uh, going to this reliability analysis part, uh, again we come to our previous discussion 
which is related to the validity of the instrument. Now here, uh, basically, validity is related to whether an uh, instrument may is what it is set out to may here. So uh, content validity can be done or even face validity can be done by sharing this uh, uh, instrument or questionnaire with the experts and we try to find out their consent on that and what kind of changes they are suggesting and based on the input from various managers. Validity basically uh, of an instrument or questionnaire basically does tell us what it is out to measure and this is a vital instrument also like reliability and before testing uh, or uh, distributing these questionnaires in the field, it is very much vital that uh, w reliability and validity tests should be made. Again, they sh can only be done through collecting data from respondents prior to the going to t respondents which have been highlighted in the study. Now, in this case, majorly two types of validities are mostly discussed. There are though other types of validities, but nowadays uh, it is more helpful and focusing and focused by uh, ha having a narrative from this these two methods of content validity and construct validity. Now here content validity basically gives us the evidence that content of a test is according to the content of the construct it was designed to cover. Now here uh, one method is that you just distribute the questionnaire, make a focal group and ask the opinion of all the experts which you have gathered related to that topic that whether these questions would be able to measure the concept which we have already discussed before. And uh, we basically, in through this methodology, one can get the feedback from all the focal persons who play an important role in formulating the various theories and research, and also from the industrial aspect as well, from managers who can give us the idea whether the questionnaire which we want to test in the field is valid or not. Uh, then comes the construct validity part because construct validity basically involves more of statistical tools in order to validate the constructs as a measure of uh, validity. So uh, here basically uh, this is very much vital that uh, construct validity is carried out on the same pilot study test on which reliability analysis was carried out. Uh, this construct validity part basically uh, is the application of statistical tool in order to validate the questionnaire and in order to do that the most common technique which is used is factor analysis. Factor analysis basically is an important tool which is used for testing the construct validity and uh, though there are many tests, different types of tests for testing factor analysis and different types of factor analysis, that is why that we have to be very careful while choosing which type of factor analysis which we need uh, for testing our constructs in the study. So here in this case, uh, uh, content validity or even named uh, term uh, also called face validity is uh, basically getting the opinion of the experts from academia and industry about the questionnaire but more vital part therefore is that we have to get the responses from selected group of respondents and then once we have got that in our pilot study then we try to test the validity, the construct validity through statistical procedure. And factor analysis basically is a very rigorous uh, statistical procedure which is used to test this kind of validity. So 
coming to the details uh, we can see uh, one type which is very much commonly used is called exploratory factor analysis. Uh, in reality, there are two major types of factor analysis. One is exploratory factor analysis and the other is confirmatory factor analysis. Both have got their own importance and prior to uh, year 2090s and 80s era, uh, basically exploratory factor analysis was mostly used to test the construct validity of a certain questionnaire. Uh, now here, uh, basically let's see uh, what is exploratory factor analysis. Now exploratory factor analysis basically it's a technique which is used to identify the underlying structure uh, among the variables in the analysis. So in other words, it's trying to validate, it's trying to uh, portray whether all the questions uh, which are attached to a certain variable, are they representing that variable? Uh, are they valid or not? Under the light of the responses which are given by uh, various stakeholders in this case. Now, uh, in order to commence with which method basically should be used, uh, whether we should go for exploratory or confirmatory. So in exploratory, we are basically not bounding any question with any construct. So the SPSS or software is free to attach any question with other construct of the questionnaire if it seems, if it seems to the software that that specific uh, uh, question is more linked to the other construct. But again, these are statistical interpretations. So we do have to uh, basically consult the theory and see what the theory says. And based on that, then we have to go ahead with the exploratory factor analysis. So uh, like exploratory factor analysis are also, are also termed as EFA. Basically, this uh, tool is used to explore any kind of uh, questions or structure of the variable. So it is quite possible that a question within one variable may be shifted to other variable uh, in the results of factor analysis, thus portraying that that specific variable or question is more related to other construct. So, uh, uh, we cannot just commence with shifting our questions which are attached to a specific construct by simply uh, taking those uh, variables or co items or questions and just putting them in other uh, constructs items. It's not that easy. First you have to see whether the shifting of that specific uh, question to that specific variable or to that specific uh, concept is theoretically justified or not. If it is theoretically justified, then we can think of shifting that specific variable to the other variable uh, or construct which EFA is mentioning that that question is more relevant to that idea. So in this uh, factor analysis part, we have to commence and we have to take along both uh, the theory and the results of factor analysis in order to decide which type of question would go to which kind of variable. So this cannot be done based on these mere uh, statistical analysis because they are just giving you the results in hard data form without knowing any logic uh, which uh, under which those data values were put in that machine. So uh, basically that's why we have to see manually as well whether the specific uh, variable or question is related to theory over there 
or not if it is then we can move to other steps but otherwise if it is not then we have to look for treatments in this case so in today's lecture basically we discussed about the applications of data transformation and we just had a view of how the data distribution is uh, affected by transforming the data here and uh, then uh, we had a discussion on whether to transform or not and what are the arguments by various important uh, theory workers and researchers about whether to transform the data or not and if we have to transform what precautions should be made and what effects or negative effects the transformation can have so uh, again after that then we went through uh, the our topic related to reliability statistics and uh, what is reliability analysis here why it is used and uh, basically we discussed that it's basically telling us about the internal consistency of a specific construct related to the questions which are related to it and uh, we try to found uh, find this out through spss and in that we do come to know that which question basically in a specific questionnaire is relevant to our construct concept or not uh again after that uh reliability statistics can be termed to be very high and uh, they can be above 0.90 and they can be low as well normally values above 0.7 are termed to be satisfactory but again we must be very careful because values above 0.9 are also termed to be uh abnormally high so in order to cater for that we do have to see what is the implication of that such high value and uh, whether it was possible under that theoretical concept or not then we had uh, the its application in spss how to run for reliability analysis and how to generate the result and what are the different terms which are used in this generating the results for this reliability statistic and then we had a brief introduction of how to carry out validity test for questionnaire and in this case one important aspect was related to face validity and the other was construct validity now once uh, these two had been defined we discussed how to determine the construct validity and how factor analysis can be used for validification of that questionnaire so this was uh, all related to this lecture thank you so much allah hafiz